Additive manufacturing is a digital manufacturing process. It needs software to work, but it also enables unique design opportunities when used in conjunction with design-based software tools like topology optimization. I'm Stephanie Hendrickson, Senior Editor with Additive Manufacturing Media. I'm joined today by Matt Humerick, Engineering Manager at Advitech Pacific, um, which focuses on mechanical design, engineering analysis, and manufacturing support, as well as Pam Waterman, 3D Printing Applications Engineer for Phoenix Analysis and Design Technologies, or PADT, a 3D printer and software reseller that specializes in simulation. Um, both of these companies have worked together and collaborated on various projects, and they've both kind of been at this forefront of using um, advanced software for design and simulation. So today we're going to look at an example where software was applied to topology optimize an existing part. Um, so Matt, what is the part that we're going to be talking about today? Uh, today we'll be talking about this uh, torque arm, that you can see is outlined in black here. Uh, this connects a linear actuator to this bell crank assembly that uh, through these unison rings ultimately position the inlet guide vanes to the compressor section for a gas turbine engine. So this part, um, so this is sort of a, a legacy part and it was redesigned for additive manufacturing because of the, the low volumes that you needed, but also because of the design ben benefits possible from topology optimization. Um, Pam, how would you describe topology optimization as a design strategy? It's a way to simulate the mechanical behavior of a part with one or more goals in mind. Very often you're trying to minimize the mass of a part that you have a design for, but you think you could do better. So you can set up a goal, whether it is that minimum mass, or perhaps you're trying to maximize the stiffness or even minimize the displacement of how that part works in its application. So this software allows the designer to put in the geometry of their part and then spec some things such as, okay, you can take away 30% of the mass, or you can add mass in some areas, but not over here, where you know that part has to interact with a third or a fourth part kind of thing in an assembly. Then you set loads and boundary conditions, and that software cranks through, gives you a new design, kind of like an outline, and then you use that as guidance to redesign your existing CAD. So a couple of different different um, benefits that you mentioned there. Um, Matt, why did Advitech decide to explore topology optimization for this specific part? What, what were the goals? Um, well, this project was part of an effort to help one of our existing customers um, adapt this uh, legacy gas turbine engine family to new market opportunities. So part of that is uh, redesigning parts to lower manufacturing cost, um, redesigning parts to meet new uh, emissions and efficiency requirements, uh, as well as dealing with things like part obsolescence. Uh, it's the reason why we specifically chose this part uh, for this trade study. And basically we chose it because it's a simple part. It's just a beam with a transverse load applied. And that way we can compare the results we get from the software op optimization to uh, something you get from a traditional hand calculation. Okay, so um, let's dive in. Uh, Matt, would you show us what it looks like to to redesign this torque arm? All right, so the first step in doing the topology optimization um, starts off the same as any structural analysis. Um, you know, you prepare and bring in your geometry, you mesh the part, apply contact elements if necessary, um, set up your boundary conditions and loads, and then you, know, you even do a start with a static structural analysis. So here you can see uh, my assembly, uh, the bell crank assembly and the torque arm that we're looking at. Um, in this case, um, the torque arm volume that I set up for topology optimization is actually a little bit different than the original part. Um, so I already know that uh, you know bending is the primary load on this part. Um, so I increase the height uh, or thickness of the parts uh, in this direction, uh, already knowing that um, that is going to drastically affect the stiffness of the part. Um, so uh, that's another important thing when doing the topology optimization is 
Um, you want to give the software uh, as much freedom as possible. So one way you can do that is by giving it a larger material envelope to work with. Uh, so <clears throat> once you uh, set up your your model, um, there's I won't go through all the, the various settings, but there's a few uh, primary steps you need to follow. The first is going to be to define your optimization region. Um, so obviously I don't want to optimize the entire bell crank assembly. I only want to focus on this arm. So I can pick just those volumes that I want the software um, to optimize, uh, which in this case are, you can see here in blue. Uh, the next step is to set your objective or goal. And uh, in this case, my goal is to minimize uh, the weight of the part. Next, you'll need to define uh, one or more constraints. Um, for this uh, rather simple analysis, my constraint is to um, make sure that the part does not exceed the yield stress of the material. So I just set a, a von Mises stress criterion here. Um, without this constraint, obviously, it's the goal to minimize mass. It would just erase your entire part if you didn't have something constraining it. Uh, so at that point, um, the optimization run is uh, all set up, and then you would go through and solve it. Um, topology optimization is an iterative process. So basically, you know, it starts with this initial model. It does a static structural analysis. It looks at your requirements, whether they were the deflection or stress. Um, and then it basically goes in and deletes elements that it, do that it doesn't need. So it'll delete some elements, it'll go back, run another structural analysis iteration, evaluate the criteria, delete more elements, and so on and so on, uh, until it, it uh, gets to a point where um, removing any more material would violate uh, your constraints. So uh, for this part, uh, this is uh, what you end up with. Um, maybe I'll go back and we'll look at the uh, final shape again just for comparison, to refresh our memories here. Um, so there'll be uh, several features that um, were intuitive that you would expect. Obviously for a beam and bending, uh, you end up with a shape that looks like an I-beam as that's very efficient. And another feature that you would expect to see are these uh, tapered flanges on the I-beam that uh, get thicker towards the base. Um, but as you can see, there's some other features that are not immediately intuitive uh, that from what you would get from a standard hand calculation. Um, so if we go back to what we get from the optimization software, obviously this does not look like the final part, um, but you can see that um, a general I-beam shape, and looking at it from the side, you can see how um, those I-beam flanges are tapered. And <clears throat> another interesting feature is the asymmetry of the web in particular. And you can kind of see, instead of a traditional I-beam where you just have a web that runs down the center, uh, this web you know, it starts off in the center and then sort of snakes around and ends up uh, over here towards the, the inner edge here. And the reason for that is due to the elasticity of both the torque arm and the drive arm. So as you apply load to this, uh, you have elastic deflections, and the result is that you don't get an even uh, distribution of load through this contact surface. Instead, um, after this part uh, deforms, you have basically a lot of edge contact along the inner edge and almost no load transfer at all uh, towards the outer end of the shaft. So then how do we go from that topology optimized model to these final designs with, with the, the lattice in the middle? So from here, the next step, um, is to export uh, this 
as geometry, as just sort of a blob surface geometry um, into a traditional CAD package. So in this case, I used NX. And <clears throat> what I did uh, specifically for this web, since uh, you know it does sort of have a complex curvature here, is I just went in and cut section cuts uh, through this web at various axial positions and then use that to um, as a guide to kind of clean up and construct uh, a shape that uh, you know you'd actually want to produce. I think that's that's an important point. Um, you know, we we talk about the power of the software and all the things it can do, but it, the fact is, it still needs an engineer's eye on it, and it still needs some human interaction to arrive at something that's that's going to ultimately work for the end result. The topology optimization isn't going to produce geometry that you can immediately hit a button and, you know, 3D print. Uh, there's still going to be some cleanup and some massaging that you'll need to do uh, to get it into uh, a producible part. So I did that, you know, specifically, you know, with the web. And then, you know, once I got uh, a lattice structure in there and kind of cleaned it up, uh, the final step is to bring it back into ANSYS and do a, another structural analysis to verify that um, you are, you know, again, meeting your stress or deflection targets. Um, in my case, where I discovered that the lattice structure I came up with initially uh, wasn't uh, as efficient as it could be, so there were still some stress hot spots. So I went back, um, tweaked this lattice structure in here um, a little bit more, changed the fillet radii a little bit, uh, and then ended up at this uh, final design. <clears throat> which compared to the original, um, we were able to see a 45% weight savings while maintaining the exact same stiffness of the original part, which uh, was also a design constraint because uh, we didn't want to change the compliance uh, of this mechanism uh, because that could change the, the positioning of the guide vanes. And so this final part has been designed to be 3D printed in stainless steel, which is the same material as the, the original part? Yes. Um, so that was uh, sort of another uh, step in the kind of the cleanup design stage is uh, prepping the final geometry uh, for additive. Um, you know, one of the things is, was going to be, you know, selecting your print direction, uh, which in this case uh, is based on the, you know, the material properties and the strength requirements. So in this case, we're going to build uh, from this surface uh, through the thickness in this direction. Um, so you'll see that, um, you know, on the opposite side, you know, you have some additional material here uh, where the, uh, the part interfaces with the, the drive arm, whereas on the opposite side, I cut that material off so that we could get a perfectly flat edge um, that, to put onto the build plate. We also went in and uh, added additional material stock um, both at both of these interface points up here with the link pin and also with the drive arm, because uh, those will be uh, machined uh, after, it's at, after the additive manufacturing process. Those, those surfaces will go back and get machined for tighter tolerances. So looking at that original design compared to what you ultimately ended up with, um, how is this design better than, than the original part that it replaces? Um, I guess the main thing is going to be the weight reduction, um, which you know, was our goal uh, for this uh, trade study. Um, and I think you know, the other really interesting thing is you know, looking at the final shape is that even for something as simple as you know this this drive arm or torque arm, um, you can get a very non-intuitive result with topology optimization. Um, you know, if you were to go in and you know say optimize this based on hand calculations, you'd probably end up with a symmetric ID. Whereas using the optimization software. Um, you get an I-beam, but with a very unsymmetric design. 
uh, specifically, you know, for this web, you know, you probably wouldn't have thought that the, the web would curve <clears throat> towards this inside edge uh, like it did. Um, so that was kind of a, a non-intuitive result that I think highlights the benefits of using topology optimization, um, not just as a tool to you know, minimize the weight of an existing design, but you can also use this as a tool, as a design tool, um, to come up with designs that, uh, you know, aren't intuitively obvious. Uh, so, you know, as more of a creative tool. I, I like this example a lot because it's clear looking from looking at the finished design. Um, you can see the influence of the software. Like you can see kind of how the the um, the webbing curves and some of those non-intuitive features, but you can also see things like the the straight edge and these touches um, that are more on the human side, trying to figure out how to take this information that the software has given you and translate it into something that's going to work. And ultimately, this would be a metal part, but because this topic was so interesting and the geometry came out with these sort of unexpected results, we've decided to print the parts just on a 3D printer in ABS to show as samples. So here's a version of the original arm. So you can see how symmetric it is. And it's a half scale. And then here's the geometry that Matt came up with. You can see that truss stress um, structure. And if I turn it right side up, we just put some names on the side. So it says ANSYS topology, and PADT Advitech, but pretty cool to actually see how that came out. So we're gonna be using it for a lot of samples and discussion. I think it's just a really intuitive pairing. Okay, uh, Matt, Pam, thank you so much for being here. Um, if you'd like to learn more about this application or the use of topology optimization along with 3D printing, you can find more information in the links below. And for more about the industrial use of additive manufacturing, visit additivemanufacturing.media.